Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. Whether you are with us in the church building or participating online, we're really pleased to have you with us today. Please do stay, if you can, for tea and coffee uh, after the service. Uh, you don't have to rush away. It's a good opportunity to chat. So if you are able to, to stay, uh, please, please uh, uh, do so. Have a few dates uh, for your diary, uh, all of which have just uh, come up in the past 24 hours or so. So uh, there'll be a service of commemoration and prayer following the Queen's passing, a service of, comm of commemoration and prayer will be held on Wednesday evening, Wednesday the 14th of September at Ferentosh Free Church at 7.30. This special service will be an opportunity to celebrate and commemorate by giving thanks to God for the Queen's Christian witness and legacy as we recognize the significance of the events of the last week the declaration of a new king and the appointment of a new prime minister. There is much to pray for as our nation faces an uncertain future. So everyone is encouraged to attend. Please feel free to bring a friend or bring a neighbor. And there'll also be tea and coffee uh, served at the end of that service. So that's this Wednesday evening, 7.30 at Ferentosh Free Church. So the missionary focus uh, prayer meeting, which was ori originally sh uh, scheduled for this Wednesday, will now take place on Wednesday the 21st of September. And the congregational meeting that was originally scheduled for the 21st of September will now take place on Wednesday the 5th of October. So we will include details of the 21st of September and the 5th of October in this week's newsletter, but you'll appreciate that the timing didn't uh, permit us to uh, include that in, in this week's newsletter. So, uh, on to our worship service this evening, uh, this morning. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome back Reverend Alberto uh, Du Paola from uh, Brody Ferry. Uh, Alberto, we're very pleased to have you with us and look forward to worshiping God with you this morning. Uh, good morning to all of you. It's just a, a privilege once again to be here. It's incredible how time uh, flies. It's been two years. It was September 2020 when uh, I had the privilege for the first time to be here with uh, the church. Uh, those were strange times, weren't they? Because I couldn't see your face and you could barely see mine. Uh, but here we are now. I can, we can see each other face to face without any masks, without any hindrances, and we can give thanks to the Lord uh, for that and give praise to him that COVID, it's becoming more and more a thing of the past, although, of course, we still need to be careful as we hear still cases of people uh, getting it, but not as severely as impairing as it was before, and we can give thanks to the Lord for that, and it's a privilege because one of the main characteristics of the church is the fact that God has brought us to be together as we are, in a sense, you know, we are training here to be together forever. So we better get on with each other and learn how to do it now. As you know, in heaven, we will spend much more time and more quality of time together in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I bring the greetings of Brothy Ferry Presbyterian Church and they are praying for you and praying for us here, as I'm sure we are also benefiting from your prayers and intercessions to the Lord as a church down there in Dundee. We start our time of worship together reading a passage from Scripture. It's in the book of Psalms, Psalm 46, verses 1 through to verse 7. Psalm 46, verse 1 through to verse 7. 7. And if you're using the church Bibles, the page number is 570. Psalm 46, 1 through to 7. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake in their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us sing together a reminder of our strength and our security in the work and person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Christ alone. Let's join together, together in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you that in a world in turmoil, we have in you our refuge and strength. 
an ever-present help in times of trouble. Sometimes, Father, we do fear, and although, Lord, the earth give way and mountains fall into the heart of sea, and though its waters roar and foam, we fix our eyes on you, whose love upon us in Christ takes away, casts away all fear, all sense of apprehension and insecurity. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our solid rock and foundation. We thank you, Lord, for the hope we have in him, which is like an anchor that keeps us fixed to him and attached to him and his kingdom in spite of the troubles of this world. We thank you for his presence in us that is communicated to us by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for his promise to be present at the gathering of your people, which happens in his name. We bow down before you, O Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, aware that you are not limited by our affections, our emotions, but you are faithful to your promises to always be with your people because your covenant and your promise and your word is faithful and true. We come recognizing our flaws, our limitations, our imperfections, our sins, our transgressions, asking for grace and forgiveness, for the renewal and the refreshing of our souls in your presence, under the blood of Jesus Christ that speaks for us, speaks on our behalf, presenting his righteousness before your eyes, your searching eyes, declaring us forgiven and acceptable in your sight. We, Father, pray for the work and power of your Spirit. So as we walk in the Spirit, Lord, we leave behind the ways of our worldly views in order to embrace the things from above where Christ now lives. We are here as the gathering of your people to worship you. So help us always, Lord, to have you, O triune God, at the center and the reason why we're here and why we sing praises and say prayers, read your word and meditate upon it. This bestow, Father, your blessing upon your people as, Lord, we serve you with an aim, with a goal to see your spirit pleased and to see your people grow, not only in numbers, but in the depth of their relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We have something here in my pocket. Well, let me see the boys and girls. So, yeah, okay, this side here. Do you mind if I step down? Is that all right? Okay. I have one thing here. Do you know what this is? What's this? Yeah. It's a penny. Is it a penny? I don't think it's a penny. Higher. What's more expensive than a penny? You can come and have a look. What's this? A one pound. A one pound. Well done. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a one pound. Well, in this one pound coin, I have the face of someone. Who is this person here? Whose face is this? Yeah. Yes, that's the queen. It's interesting. Why is the face of the queen here on this one pound coin? Do you know that? I had to go to Wikipedia to find the answer. <laughs> and it was hard because, you know, I tried to find the answer. Eventually, I found a phrase. It's the symbol, and it's a big word here. I'll try to explain. It's a symbol of sovereignty. That's a big word, isn't it? Sovereignty. Even for me, and I'm not even from this country. Sovereignty. Basically, it means, you know, here in this land, do you want to know who the queen is, who is the ruler of the land? Look at the picture. 
In Jesus' time, it was the same. Sometimes people would buy things. They would buy things with coins, maybe fish, maybe clothing. Maybe they, well, they, they didn't have cars in those days, in Jesus' day, do they? They didn't have cars. But they had horses and donkeys and cows and sheep, and they could use coins to buy them. And because it was a different world from ours, sometimes they would use coins with the face of the emperor. His name was Caesar. And it was the same thing. Oh, if the face of the emperor is on the coin, well, we know who is the guy who is in charge of things here in this land, even if they didn't like. Well, I, I'm coming from Brazil. I can say that I, I, I liked the queen, okay? And I prayed for her all these years. And every year we'd pray on Remembrance Day for the queen and for all in authority and those who fought wars uh, uh, to keep us safe and protected here. But, you know, only recently I started to think, well, why is her face here? Because it means that while she was alive, she was the ruler, the queen, the sovereign, the person in charge on top of everybody and the land. Now, I have another thing here in my pocket. What is it? What is it? It's bigger than a coin, and it's not made of metal. It doesn't help, does it? It's a cross. The coin, where is it? My pockets are very deep. The coin has a symbol in it. But the cross is also a symbol, isn't it? What if I tell you, you remember the big word I said here? You remember the big word? Sovereignty, which means who is in charge, who, you know, who has authority, who is the person you should obey. So I should obey the queen, you know, because she's the queen, the ruler of the land. But the cross tells me about another ruler, tells me about another king. You know who this king is, don't you? When I think of the cross, who do I think about? Oh, you know that. It's the right answer in every children's address. <laughs> Which is it? Yes. Jesus. Jesus. You know what happened to Jesus, don't you? Uh, we were singing about it, weren't we? Till on the cross, we, we sang about it. How Jesus was crucified, died for you, died for me. But how he rose from the dead. And it's interesting, before Jesus... This was a very ugly symbol. After Jesus, it became such a nice symbol that speaks of sacrifice, of love, but also tells me that Jesus, before, you know, he received the crown in heaven, after he rose from the dead, he went through suffering, not for himself, he didn't do anything wrong, but he suffered for me and for you, to pay the price of our sins. Now, many churches, we have, well, that's an interesting symbol about Jesus, but that's for another children's address, you know, the two Greek letters in the middle there, okay? But that's for another children's address. But here, we have the symbol that Jesus, in order to become your king and my king, endured your pain and my pain, your suffering and my suffering, your struggle and my struggle, your sin and my sin. <gasps> the minister has sins, afraid so, because I need as much the love and the power of Jesus as anybody else. And I need as much forgiveness from Jesus as anybody else. And I need what Jesus did on that cross on that day as much as anybody else. And you know what? Whenever I think of the cross, I not only think about the suffering of Jesus, but I think about how he gained, not a big word, authority. Okay? Mom and dad, they are the authority at home, aren't they? Mom, can I go and play with so-and-so? No. Ah. Dad, can I play with so-and-so? Mom said that I can't. Well, now we know who is the authority at home. <laughs> to which dad replies, then you can't go. 
So, yes, but Jesus has that authority over me, has that authority over you. Why? Because he suffered for you. He suffered for me. He loves you. He loves me. He did what nobody could do to save you, to have you with him, so that now you live always following Jesus Christ, who endured the cross, but he's leading you now from this world to heaven to be with him forever. The coin tells me that the queen was in charge. The cross tells me that Jesus is, not was, is in charge. Can we say a prayer? Thank you, Jesus, for that. Yes, short prayer. And if you want to say this prayer with me, you can repeat after me. You don't have to. But if you want to, you can say this prayer with me. It's a short prayer, okay? So let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your cross and for everything you did to save me. Help me always to follow you as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. In your name, amen. And now we are going to sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord.
It's now the time the children will go to Sunday school or Sunday club. Yes. We read again from Scripture before we turn to our prayers of intercession. And uh, this time, I would like to invite you to read this passage with me. And the words will appear on the screen. And we will do it the following way. I read the first verse, congregation responds, reading the second verse, and so on, until we read the whole psalm. It's a short psalm, eight verses. And we, as a congregation, we will share in the reading of that word. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watching for the morning, more than watching for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And we give thanks to the Lord. For his word. As we all know, our queen passed away, and as a nation, we mourn the loss of a dignified, faithful uh, woman and sovereign over uh, all the lands of the United Kingdom. So we can give thanks to the Lord for her life. We can praise his name for how she conducted uh, as a sovereign of the nation over 70 years, and how she added value and worth to the role she performed all these years. In particular, from what I heard from those who uh, knew her best and who her better, her Christian faith, her personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and how that was vividly demonstrated at the ceremony of her coronation before receiving all the symbols of her power and authority, she knelt before he who is the Lord and sovereign over the whole world, over the whole universe, asking his blessing, grace, and strength. For that reason, before we actually engage with our prayers uh, for others, I'd like to invite you to stand as we will have a one-minute silence uh, in memory and respect to, uh, uh, towards, uh, with regards to the life of our now uh, late queen. Could you please stand? Please be seated. We will pray for others. We will pray for the country. We will pray for the royal family. And after, we will say the Lord's Prayer. 
Let us pray. God and Father, we thank you for uh, Queen Elizabeth II and how she served this country and how she dedicated most of her life to the good of the United Kingdom and its citizens. How she never shied away from her Christian roots and over and over again she reaffirmed her faith, her Lord and Sovereign Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for all these 70 years and how she set the tone and raised the bar about how a sovereign should behave and conduct him or herself in the public and private matters of, of his or her life for the good of the country they serve in that position of high authority. We pray for the royal family, given, Lord, that before being royal, they are a family. And being a family, like any family where love is nurtured and protected, they mourn and they hurt, not simply the loss of the sovereign, but the loss of a mother, the loss of a grandmother, the loss of a great grandmother. And we pray that the consolations from above would be upon them, upon the new king, Charles III, and the whole family embraced in your care and in your protection. We pray for a mourning nation. If we mourn her, it's because she is going to be missed, uh, because she was meaningful, she was important, she was relevant, and she was cherished by many even by those who wouldn't share the same faith that she professed to have. We pray that we as a nation will not feel distraught and, Lord, confused. But since, Lord, you have the power over the elements, as we read from Psalm 46, since you, Father, is the one who can guide us even when we stumble and fall in your redemption, salvation, forgiveness, and grace, we pray that this will be a nation under the same care. In spite, Lord, of the overall attitude of this nation towards the gospel and towards the crucified and risen Christ and Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for a society that will uh, now start to turn their eyes and ears to what you do and to what you say and realize that kingdoms do fall, but the word of the God stands, remains forever. Bless this congregation in its witness to the wider community of the life, grace, and forgiveness, salvation in Christ. Enable us, Lord, as your people in this part of the country to be a source of light and guidance and encouragement to others, whether they are times of peace or struggle. And keep us, Father, with our eyes fixed on him who, although have well, although he endured death for our sake, he is now alive and he reigns forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. The same Lord Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Before we read the passage we're going to study this morning, we sing Psalm 130, and we sing it to the tune, Ayrshire.
we read from Scripture and we read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, the first five verses. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, the first five verses of the Gospel. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. And we give thanks to the Lord for his word. Let us pray again. Father, thank you for your word and grant us grace, Lord, and wisdom in the way we convey it to your people. And Lord, your servant also needs to learn and to apply these words to his own life so that together here we are not over or beside but under the authority of the living Christ speaking to us through his gospel. May it be so, Lord, for the glory of your name and the good of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is almost the end of Matthew's gospel, and as we reach this point in Matthew's narrative, it is clear that things are moving to a conclusion. Things are moving to a point of resolution. All the Gospels have that aspect in the way they present to us the message and the acts of Jesus Christ when He was walking here on earth during His ministry. On one side, you see Jesus uh, becoming more uh, or becoming clearer and clearer about who He is, His identity, His nature, His divine calling and divine nature as the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the promised King. On the other hand, you see in all the Gospels this growing resistance and this growing antipathy towards Jesus Christ that will result in His crucifixion. The itinerant ministry is finished. The gospel was proclaimed, sinful people challenged and called to repentance. Kingdom power and mercy continuously emanated from Jesus Christ. Power to cast out demons. Mercy in the forms of the many healings he performed. Not simply as a show or display of power, but manifestation of grace and mercy. The previous section, the previous chapters that precede chapter 26, they uh, speak of the end times, the coming of Jesus and the end times, chapters 24 and chapters 25. And from that we learn that the kingdom will be eternal and the judgment from the kingdom inescapable. Those who align with Jesus in faith will not be disappointed. That's the message. Actually, instead, they will be rewarded. All that are left are the final stages in God's plans to save His people through the offering of His Son as the sacrifice for the sins of the world, followed then by the resurrection. The time of the year couldn't be more appropriate. It's the Passover That's the Passover festival with the slaughtering of the lamb and whose blood would then be presented and poured uh, on the altar. Like in the Old Testament, Jesus predicts his death as a means to spare his followers from God's impending judgment upon the world. If you know your Bibles well, you know Passover, it was instituted in the book of Exodus when the Israelites were delivered from the Egyptians, and it was the last plague, as sometimes it's known, and how God sends that destruction to kill every firstborn in every household in the land of Egypt, but the Israelites were spared. 
Because the, lamb, the, the blood of the sacrifice was smeared or painted, if you like, on the doorposts. And that sacrifice covered so that the judgment from God to the land passed over them and reached those who were not protected, shielded by the Passover lamb and what it symbolized. The focus of this whole section then is on Jesus' final act as the Son of God. Remember here how he, Matthew introduces the words here. When Jesus had finished all these words, from now on, it's just the tying up of everything that needs to be tied up, and then it's the cross. And it's interesting, some commentators will associate Matthew in the way that Moses uh, uh, put together the five first books of the Bible, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, in the sense that towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses as well, he's about to die, and he then delivers his final words in Deuteronomy 31 and 32, which could be an indication that Matthew here wants to make that connection that Jesus is that promised prophet that Moses said, there is one that will come after me. And Matthew might be pointing them to that conclusion saying, Jesus, he is the one. Instead of comfort, Jesus will endure suffering. Instead of life, he will end up dead. Instead of glory, he will face humiliation. What the passage tells us, though, is that this is by no means an accident, an unfortunate development of the events. Because Satan is not in control. The Jewish authorities are not in control of the situation as well. God is. Jesus is fully aware of that. And he is fully aware of what is waiting him. The plotting against him continues. But this time, it looks like finally that they mean business. All they need is an opportunity. And you see in the passage how they discuss about it. When is the best time for it? Notice that their preference is for Jesus' death to happen after the festival, when Jerusalem's population would be reduced back to its normal figures. After the festival, the memory of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, would be fading since it looked like the majority of Jesus' supporters lived elsewhere. Consider, especially in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus spends a lot of time in the north, coming very occasionally to the south, to, the south, to Jerusalem. So that's where his followers normally would be expected to be from. Well, that's the, 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 the religious leader's plan to wait for the festival to go over, to wait for the temperature to go down. And when Jesus now becomes more of a memory of the past, after all, the kingdom will not arrive in their minds. Now we grab him, we arrest him, and we kill him. And we'll find any excuse that will give us the right to do so. That's their plan, but we know the story, and we know that that never happened. It didn't happen as they wanted it to be. Jesus' prophecy in the passage here is very specific. After two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. That's verse number two. It's going to be before the festival, not after. Let us remember again that with all the other Gospels, there is a considerable attention to the events that lead to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Almost a third of all the Gospels, they give attention to that. We see the unfolding of the greatest of all sufferings being superseded by the greatest of all glories. We could say that the whole of our understanding of Scriptures hinges on these accounts of his death and resurrection. There will be progressive stages in Jesus' suffering. 
as he is finally led to the cross. But for now, let us consider the general theme of suffering through the lenses of God's sovereign, here's the big word again, of God's sovereign control over everything. We have to bear in mind that not only Jesus suffered for us, we also share in his sufferings. That's the apostolic understanding of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. There is a singular element to what Jesus did that cannot be shared by anyone. Only Jesus could have gone to the cross. Only Jesus could have paid for our sins. Only Jesus could be the acceptable sacrifice that now finally puts us together, reconciled, and at peace with God. But at the same time, we are united with Him. Not only in His resurrection, we are united with Him and his death. So it's always right to be remembered, we follow the crucified and risen Christ in the sense that we endure a measure of suffering in following him with that expectation of glory that he now enjoys and that he promises to everyone who believes in him. For the church then, the two ideas go in tandem. Christ suffered for us, and now we share in his sufferings. Paul writes to the Romans, mentioning that. Paul writes to the Philippians, chapter 3, mentioning that. Peter writes to the, to the, to the churches in the region of the dispersion, whatever, and he mentions that correlation as, as well, which gives meaning, since now we know the meaning of Christ's suffering, his suffering gives meaning to yours, to mine. Because sometimes it does feel like it's meaningless, doesn't it? Sometimes it does feel like it's pointless, doesn't it? And sometimes meaning will only really come to a solution, to a resolution that meaningless, uh, uh, should I say, only comes to a resolution when we finally close our eyes to the troubles of this life. And according to the promises of Jesus himself, we open our eyes to that glory that is awaiting us because he preceded us. A reminder that to follow Jesus is, where is it? to take up your cross. And remember, in Jesus' time, this is an instrument of terrible, excruciating death. And you know the word excruciating comes from the word cross. I'm assuming you, you, you know that, at least some of you. Take up your cross and follow me, he would say. So my first point here is that he suffered as the son of man. That's the title we have mentioned uh, here, as well as we see uh, spare, uh, uh, dispersed throughout the, the Gospels and Matthew as well. And the Son of Man points to two directions. Jesus is truly human, but also brings to mind, especially to those who knew him and who knew their Bibles in the days of Jesus, to prophecies from the past, Prophet Daniel chapter 7. And in there we read about someone like a son of man who receives all glory, all power, all dominion. His kingdom will be eternal. And it's interesting to pay attention to this description because at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus Christ commissions the church to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, doesn't he? But before saying that, what does he say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why? Because he is the son of man of Daniel chapter 7. Before enduring humanity in its frailty, before enduring humanity, bearing upon himself the punishment that humans deserve for their rebellion, disobedience, and sin, he is the son of man who approaches the ancient of days and receives the rule, authority, and dominion over the whole kingdom 
all of this universe, if you like to put it that way. Whereas that prophecy points to the final outcome of his work, here Jesus, we see him preparing to suffer as an integral part of his mission. When I was born, well, not that I would have any memory of that, but even now, if I try to look back, suffering was not on the job description. I didn't realize that I come into this world as a human being and suffering is going to be there. When my children were born, I was expecting that none of them would ever have to endure suffering. But then, you know, they stumble, they fall, you take them to the doctor and they are stitched up or they fall ill and you go to the doctor and, you know, you put the lines on their veins and they have to be treated and you think about death and dying and scars and side effects and long, maybe lasting a, a, a transformation, life-changing transformations that when we enter into this world, we were not expecting. Jesus came to die, not only a peaceful, quiet death, but the death that represents, embraces every single one deserving the punishment from a holy, pure, almighty, majestic God. We can say that Jesus came to do many things. One that is constant throughout is to suffer. This here in this passage is the fourth time Jesus is saying that he's going to suffer and die. He mentioned that in chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 20, and now here again, chapter 26 in Matthew's gospel, he's talking about what needs to be done, what, need to, what, needs, what need to happen. And one thing that needs to happen is he needs to suffer, be betrayed, and die. But of course, with a note of hope, of hope, always. But don't worry. I will rise. I will come back on the, third, on the third day. He suffers together with his people as well as he suffers on behalf of all humanity. He has already established that he will return to judge and inherit the world, the two preceding chapters. Now he adds to that prophecy that he is also the perfect sacrifice through which he will gather for himself nations and kingdoms to rule over them in justice and peace. It's all part of the plan. Probably the difference between you and Jesus, between myself and Jesus, well, he knows the plan, every single bit of it. And I have to say, I don't. He has an answer to his own suffering. He has a purpose to his own suffering. In his suffering, he hints at purposes to my suffering. But sometimes, there are still gaps in my understanding of that. And that's when we move on trusting him who suffered the most and suffered first. He suffered as the Son of Man. My second point is our suffering finds meaning in his sufferings. Jesus' arrest will be a source of great joy for his enemies and great despair for his friends. How do we keep faith in times of suffering when it seems that the devil is the one in charge? In our confusion, we lament facing challenging questions about our faith and the, tr and the truth about God. Here we see the storm brewing. And this is the perfect storm. It's devastating, irresistible, extremely destructive. After all, it is the Son of God who is going to be sacrificed and will die on the cross. The Son of God will not be spared. He will not be spared. The sinless, pure, holy, wonderful, beautiful Jesus, the Messiah, 
even he will not be spared. Why then would we expect that we would be spared, would be spared from troubles and suffering in this life? As the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb, Jesus did spare us from God's wrath. But we know our Christian history reasonably well, don't we? We might have heard stories about the martyrs who suffered terribly, the persecutions, the troubles. Have you noticed that in the book of Revelation, the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, from chapter 2 to chapter 3, you have the letters addressing seven churches. In the book of Revelations, the two faithful churches of that list of seven are the very ones divested of wealth and tranquility. They are poor and in trouble, but they are faithful. They are faithful. And it is to one of them that Jesus, addressing the angel of the church, will say, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. They are powerless and under duress, but theirs is the crown of life. The point here is not so much about a fatalistic acceptance of suffering. If you are suffering, please do take painkillers or seek help if the nature of the, the suffering is not, you know, physical. Sometimes we have mental processes and heart, emotional things that need treatment and need help and support for us to get out or to cope with that burden that sometimes can really, truly become really heavy. And of course, the minister and, and church fellow uh, members, brothers and sisters who can sit beside and pray for you, pray with you. And there I say, be prayed by you. I've never been so refreshed when people in my congregation, some of them who are in pain every day, advanced arthritis, impairing even basic movements, and they pray for me. And there's something in there. The power of the crucified and risen Christ at work in the lives of those faithful followers of the wonderful Jesus, showing a measure of strength that sometimes I don't find in that intensity in those who are wealthy and healthy. So the point here is not about being fatalistic, accepting suffering, but to be aware of God's power to keep us faithful, to be aware of Christ's closeness to us in our suffering since, according to Isaiah 53, 3, since Jesus is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And to be aware that we will grow as we hope in the Lord. And once again, I quote from Isaiah. Why do you say, O Jacob? Isaiah chapter 40. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? And the prophet replies, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Through the New Testament lenses, we know that the Lord himself renewed his strength. Because the tomb is empty. The cross is empty. But the hearts of believers and the heavenly realms are filled with his glorious triumphant presence. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So I finish with this. Jesus' words here surely help the disciples make sense of all that happened once they recovered from the shock of Good Friday's event. That's how good and kind he is, sowing seeds of hope, sometimes hidden within messages of trouble and struggle. I will suffer, I will die, but I will rise. God is in control. I know that it's easier said, 
from the comfort of our affluent society. I know that. But let us learn this lesson well in case the time comes when trouble finds us. After having gone through the mill of unimaginable suffering, Job in the Old Testament finally found closure at God's revelation of power and sovereignty at the end. And Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, whether by the devil, by myself, or by this unimaginable suffering. Jesus is going to the cross and God is in control of everything. Suffering has meaning as it shows his power, even in our weaknesses. Suffering has a limit. Reason why our hope during trials is not in vain. It will come to an end. Whether it be the end of this life or, or the end of suffering in this life, I know the question remains open or the answers remain open, one or, or the other. But surely bear that in mind. It comes to an end. The promise is eternal life. The promise is crown of glory. The promise is the dutiful reward of faithful servants who are faithful in little things, now being upgraded to higher ranks in the kingdom of glory. Suffering has a limit. God's word and steadfast love throughout all this remain forever. Likewise, his company, his kingdom, peace, and justice will remain, and we will remain with him. So suffering doesn't mean that you don't have Christ or that you don't have God or that you don't have salvation, or that you don't have faith. Remember, your Lord and Savior, before you, endured suffering and invites you to take up your cross, follow him, because the journey does not end at the cross. It goes beyond the grave. It goes beyond the empty tomb. It reaches the heavenly realms where he reigns, where he lives, and where he is Lord forever and ever, not alone, but with his church. Let us pray. Thank you, God and Father, for your word. Help us, we pray, to face our trials secured, secluded in Christ, protected by everything that he did, everything that he is, and everything that he means to us as our indeed Paschal Lamb. Have mercy on us because, Lord, sometimes the burden's so heavy that we do stumble and we have to say, sometimes we do fall, we do fail. But we thank you that he doesn't. He was faithful even to the point of death. Reason why you have uh, brought him out of the dead and ascended him to heaven and sat him on the throne, crowned with glory, dignity, power, and majesty. And thank you for the reminder that indeed we are united in his sufferings, but also in his glorious victory. So keep us faithful, Father, as we battle on, as we fight on our spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons, Lord, sustained guided, strengthened, and protected by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we sing together once again as we approach the end of our service, Jesus is Lord.
now go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us here now and forever. Amen.